Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Be seated. Do you remember the TV show Cheers? Do you remember it? Of course. Where everybody knows your name. After Christmas, I decided to do one of my first Ben watching on Netflix, and I decided to choose Cheers. I remember Cheers being on when I was younger, and I would just see it maybe every few months or so, and never really got quite into it, even though I thought it was funny. And I've even been to Cheers in Boston. But this time I decided I really just wanted to sit down and watch the series and see what it was all about. It was actually funnier than I remember. But it wasn't just about a drinking scene. The real show was about relationship. In a comical way, but it was about relationships. Everyone knew each other, and through the time you could see people becoming a family there. To be honest, I love the way they shot the uh, show itself because as a viewer, it kind of made you feel like you were sitting there watching as these people were talking back and forth, and well, you were kind of one of them. It was the one place in all the world that most of the characters would tell you felt like the closest of being home. This is what I see Jesus doing this morning. Jesus is heading towards Jerusalem, his final mission, his holy week. But before he goes there, he wants to rest. So, Jesus travels to a place that everybody knows his name. No, not a bar, even though that would be a good joke to start with, right? But instead, to the home of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. He wanted to uh, be somewhere that he was comfortable, and he didn't have to be on. He was, could be himself. He wanted to be in a place that he knew he was the closest of being home. He wanted a place that everyone knew the real Jesus, who he really is. And so we find ourselves this morning again at that home of Mary and Martha and Lazarus. Remember, this family must be very close to Jesus. It doesn't go into the tip of, uh, particular relationship they have, but we know that it must have been very, very close. Matter of fact, this particular family comes up at least three times in the gospel. So you can imagine if there's three stories of them, then in reality, there must have been a lot more experience with them, and they just condensed and put these uh, stories in the gospel. This, of course, dinner that they're having when Jesus goes is after he has raised Lazarus from the dead. And so I think one of the uh, pieces that are, is also in here is that I think the story is also meant to show you that Lazarus, Jesus' biggest miracle, is still alive. And not just alive, but is going to be eating the meal with Jesus tonight. So Jesus and his disciples again stop by his fam this family that he loves so much and their home to stay and rest and have dinner with this beloved family. You can imagine the celebration of this reunion. Can you imagine how excited they were when they saw Jesus and then he picked their home, this great rabbi that they loved? You can imagine how the celebration was going because, well, at least the last time we know he was there, he raised Lazarus after four days of being dead. Remember for the sisters, that without Lazarus during Jesus' time, they could have been exposed to a lot of different crime, etc., without having the male there to protect them. So in other words, Jesus didn't just save Lazarus. He saved this family. And that's worth celebrating. You can imagine all of them, not the disciples and Lazarus, as they're laying down on their carpet with their feet out as Martha is preparing for them the best of olives and olive oil and bread and lamb and all the other foods that come with it. You can imagine the laughing and all that is going on as Martha is running back and forth just like Martha does, right? And taking care of the, the household and taking care of this dinner. We don't know if Jesus actually talked about his final mission as he was sitting there uh, with, with his disciples. But it sounds like he does because of what happens next. It says that it's after dinner. Mary does something very unusual. She brings out a pound of cross, uh, costly perfume made out of pure nard. Now to understand in Jesus' 
culture once again. Somebody would take care of your feet, but this is when you first walk in the house and they would take care of it. Now, I want you to understand that for Mary, do, or Mary doing this at a table or at a dinner with all men in the room, this is a bit of a taboo during Jesus' time. So the early church's eyes would have been a little bit uh, wider than yours right now because we're so used to it. But according to Judas, this pound of perfume made out of nard was worth 300 denarii. 300 denarii would be the equivalent of one year's pay for the common laborer. So you can tell that it's a bit of an expensive nard. The gospel states that Mary kneels down and she takes the nard and she begins to wipe it all over Jesus' feet and probably his legs and you know all on the bottom, all of that. Then Mary takes her hair and she wipes Jesus' feet with it. Judas sees this and is upset because in his eyes this was a waste and should have been sold and the money given to the poor. But the, the gospel says that Judas didn't care for the poor, but he was stealing money from the common purse. How would you like that reputation forevermore? Jesus tells Judas, leave her alone. Leave her alone, Judas. You will always have the poor, but you won't always have me. Mary seems to totally understand what is going on, and maybe she overheard what Jesus was talking about. So she is getting him ready for his mission. Remember that when Lazarus died, and Jesus tells Martha, I am the resurrection and I am the life. Jesus said to Martha, do you believe this? And do you remember what Martha said to him? Yes, Lord. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one coming into the world. This is why I believe that Jesus came to this home that day, because he knows them. He loves them dearly, and they truly believe his real identity, the resurrected resurrection and the life, the Messiah. But why did Mary do it like this? What was her uh, what was her cause to do this uh, to his feet? Why would Mary put this type of nard, for instance, on Jesus' feet? For his comfort as a good host, maybe. But truly, I think it goes way deeper than this. Let's understand the type of perfume she used. There was only two reasons why this type of caustic perfume nard is used in Jesus' day. First, it would be prepping for burial. You would go and you would buy maybe a few ounces of it from whatever store has it, and you would bring it back. And after you wash the body of your, your loved one, you would then prep them with this particular nard and that smell as you put them into the cave. And so the second reason, which I think is cool, is also for anointing a king. You see, the king has this type of perfume, nard, put on their heads as an invisible crown. So whether or not the king had his crown on, the smell itself would be the smell of a king. So if he puts it on, they would put it on quite common and walk through the marketplace. People knew obviously he's not dead. So he must be the king, and therefore you would see the people bow, is they could smell him as a king. I believe that Mary and Martha truly understood Jesus' true role, as well as this mission, and therefore she is doing both things with this particular nard. She is prepping Jesus for his final mission. She is prepping him for his death. She's also prepping him as king, and she is declaring that Jesus is in fact the Messiah. She, that this nard would have notified the world that Jesus is a king by the smell. Think about it for a moment. As Jesus has all of this on him, and he's got this powerful smell on him. Next Sunday is Palm Sunday. Imagine as Jesus is going down on the donkey, and people are waving the, their banners, and they're waving their palms in the air, saying, Hosanna in the highest. Imagine as they're doing that, what they can do is they can smell him. He is coming into Jerusalem with that smell, that overpowering perfume of being a king. You can also see that as Pontius Pilate is talking to him, this smell would have filled the courtyard and Pontius Pilate's room. You can imagine as he's talking to Jesus, maybe this is why he's asking him, are you in fact the king of the Jews? 
And Jesus is saying, well, if you say so. And they're having, he's kind of frustrated with Jesus because he's probably looking at him and then, why do you smell like a king if you're not? Where is your kingdom? You can also see why the Pharisees may have been really angry with Jesus in the courtyard because he is not saying he's the Messiah, but by gosh, he smells like the Messiah. He smells like the king. Crucify him. You can even imagine him smelling on the cross, being smelling like a king. Maybe this is why Pontius Pilate put the sign over his head, King of the Jews. And when they told him, uh, Pontius Pilate, to take it down, he said, I have written what I have written. The bottom line is Mary is willing to give everything that she has to declare to the world that Jesus is in fact the Messiah, her King. His disciples will soon learn this after the resurrection, forming the early church. Paul will learn this in proclaiming Jesus as King as he writes his letters to all the different churches. His early church will learn this and be spreading the good news of Jesus Christ throughout the world, telling him that he is in fact a king. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John will learn this also, knowing that Jesus is the king of kings, and therefore write the gospels. In other words, they will give all they have because they know inside that Jesus is in fact the king, the Messiah. And so should we. <coughs> What about us? Are we willing to give what it takes to tell the world that Jesus is in fact our King, our Messiah? Are we willing to tell the people, all people, who Jesus really is? Are we willing to tell the world that Jesus is Lord by word and example? Next week is Holy Week. Unbelievable, isn't it? It's coming next Sunday, starting next Sunday. And we are about to journey together into the story of Holy Week together as a family. We're about to hear the words of the story together as a family. We're about to participate in the story as a family. In things like foot washing, nailing the cross, going to the tomb and sitting in there for an hour, watching the tomb be sealed. We are about to experience the emotions of the story as a family. And they can get quite emotional during Holy Week. And we're about, once again, to become part of that story of Holy Week together. We're about to walk through Holy Week, and at the end, I hope all of us together will witness an empty tomb. And, we'll have, and we will all become witnesses to the resurrection. However, what good is it to go through this journey and all of these emotions? and coming to the services and listening to the words and experiencing them if we're not ready to tell the world that Jesus is in fact the King, that He's in fact the Messiah. That's what we're supposed to do. And in this year of evangelism here at Holy Trinity, we need to be more like Mary and Martha and tell the world. We need to let our community know that Jesus is in fact the King of Kings. We need to do whatever it takes to get that message out to our community. But if this starts with our own relationship with Christ, for how can we pronounce that He is King of Kings if He's not to us personally? We need to know who He is in our life. We need to meditate on that and read on that. And therefore, that's what Lent has been about. And how has your Lent been? How do you fit in the story? Have you been walking with Christ uh, closer in Lent? Are you, in fact, closer to Christ? Are you ready to walk into an empty tomb? Are you willing to tell the world that Jesus is, in fact, your King? If you're not, or you haven't quite gotten ready for Lent yet, it's about to end. So let's take this coming week and prepare ourselves for Holy Week with reading, praying, learning, and prepping. Imagine if we could get our minds around Jesus like Mary, understanding who Jesus is, understanding through faith. And that's what it is. That's the whole secret is faith. Having faith in Jesus Christ. We need to prepare ourselves in that faith. We need to remember what the mission was about and what Jesus did for us. 
We must remember that Jesus died for you and has been raised. Remember that Jesus suffered for you. Remember Jesus hung on the cross for you. Remember that Jesus died for you. Remember Jesus rose from the dead for you. Remember that the empty tomb is for you. And remember that Jesus did this for one reason. So that you can live with Him forever. Jesus tells us that He has gone to prepare a place for each and every one of you. A place where you can be present before God at all times. A place that will be like home to you. A place that everyone knows your name.